Now let's continue on where we left off, Romans 3 and verse 27. Therefore, where is boasting, it is excluded, because God gets all the glory. Through what law? The law of works? No. No longer animal sacrifices. Now we need to do true spiritual works of God. And if we have the works of God, then we're doing those. Those are not our works. So we're not trying to save ourselves by our works. We are to love God and keep his commandments. Those are the works. By no means. Rather, it is through a law of faith because you believe, as we will see. Consequently, we reckon that a man is justified by faith separate from works of law. Now, if you don't have the book Judaism, a revelation of Moses or a religion of men, and you don't have the Bible with Appendix Z in it, you need to study Appendix Z to know what works of law are. Those are the traditions of men, the works of Judaism, and the physical sacrifices at the temple which were required. The temple no longer exists. Sacrifices are no longer needed because Jesus is our sacrifice and our high priest in heaven right now, and we go through him for the forgiveness of sin with God the Father. Separate from works of law. All right? Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also God of the Gentiles? Yes! He is also God of the Gentiles. Because all of us as human beings, we live and move and have our being in God. Even the wicked partake of breathing and eating and sleeping. God has provided that for all. But for those that he calls, he's provided his spirit, he's provided his word, he's provided the understanding. And this is the unleavened bread that we are to eat, the bread of God, the word of truth. Verse 30, since it is indeed one God who will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith, are we then abolishing law through faith? May it never be. Rather, we are establishing law. Why? Because they are written in our hearts and in our minds. That's how our minds are transformed. All right, now come back here to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and let's look at this. This becomes very important for us to know and understand. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Here's what God wants. He wants you to love him with all your heart and with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your being. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the brethren as Christ has loved us. And we're to love our enemies. And there are many ways we can love our enemies. Now, here, Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Here is the whole purpose of the covenant that we are in, as we have covered for the covenant of the, of the Passover and what that means. Hebrews 10. Now Hebrews 10, let's pick it up in verse 14. For by one offering, that's what we read in Romans the third chapter. He is the propitiation, meaning the continual atoning of our sins, and we will see how that works in just a minute. For by one offering, that is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ through his crucifixion, he has obtained eternal perfection for those who are sanctified. Sanctified, set aside, just like the firstborn. All the firstborn are set aside or sanctified to God. We are the church of the firstborn. 
We are set aside and sanctified by God. We are set aside from the world. We live in the world, but we're not part of the world. Okay? Now here's what God wants. This is why you hear us say all the time, prayer and study, prayer and study, prayer and study, yielding to God. Why? And the same way with Sabbath services or keeping Sabbath at home. Now we have church at home and we have thousands that, that come to church at home. Every month, use church at home. And you read the letters that we sent out in the recent mailing. So brethren, we're serving a lot, a lot of people that we don't even know. That's the amazing thing of the internet. Okay. Okay. Eternal perfection for those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after he had previously said, now notice, this is the covenant I will establish with them after those days. Now that's after the days that Jesus came and he gave himself as an offering and sacrifice for sin. All right? Here is the covenant. This is the meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We eat the unleavened bread, which is a type of the Word of God, and we put out the leaven, which is a type of sin and vanity and arrogance and evil from within. I will give my laws into their hearts. Now that happens with the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. And remember the Word of God? It is all God-breathed, and it's all inspired by the Spirit of God. So when we read the Word of God, it is a spiritual experience, and this is to help us then let God put his laws into our hearts and inscribe them in their minds. Now, it's very interesting, inscribe, because they know that our memory within our minds is much like inscription. Memory is something written in right upon the cells of your mind. And it can be, there are different places. There's memory for sight, there's memory for smell, there's memory for sound. There is memory for ex emotion, emotional experiences, good and bad, and all of that, see? But all of that is in our minds, and we must have our minds cleansed with the washing of the water of the Word, sanctified with the Spirit of God so that we have our sins forgiven, all right there, okay? Now notice that he says, and their sins and lawlessness I will not remember ever again. Now that's really quite a promise. Now let's come to 1 John, the first chapter. Let us see how this works. Let's see what God is doing. And this is continual, see? Repenting of sin, because it's all lodged here in our minds, is a continuous thing that we do. Because, as we will see with the law of sin and death, it's right there to pull you back, to pull you back, to pull you back. See? All right. Let's pick it up. First John 3 and verse 6. 1 John, first chapter, I said 3, beg your pardon. 1 John, the first chapter, and verse 6. 1 John, the first chapter, verse 6. If we proclaim that we have fellowship with him and are walking in darkness, now we have to walk in the light of Christ. And he is the one who is the light, and we have to keep coming to him because he's the light. The word of God is the light. Okay? 
If you're walking in darkness, you're doing it without the word of God. You're doing it without the spirit of God. And you're walking in darkness in the world. And if, if the darkness that is in you is great, how great is that darkness, Jesus said. Now notice, we are lying to ourselves. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. There it is right there. Lying to yourself. And we are not practicing the truth. The truth is the word of God. That's how it's written in our hearts and minds. That's how it's converted, you see. This is how we get the leaven of sin out of our lives and put in the righteousness of God. But there's got to be the cleansing of the mind. We'll see right here. This is it. Now I want you to notice carefully how he has written this. Verse 7. However, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And then, of course, over here, verse 3, our fellowship is with God the Father and Jesus Christ, and then our fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Just exactly as Paul wrote. Now I want you to analyze this verse a little more carefully. However, if we, John is including himself. Now when John wrote this, he was probably about 85 years old. So what he's doing, he is saying that even at 85 and after being an apostle of Jesus Christ for all of those years, say 55 years or more, okay, he includes himself and the ones needing forgiveness of sin. All right? But we have to be walking in the light, that is, of God's word, as he, Christ, is in the light, and there's no sin in him, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his own son, cleanses us from all sin. Continually. Now notice. If we say we do not have sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We're all good people. We don't sin. Oh, we're all lovely and nice people. Show me one group that's really, really that way outside of those who are in the church of God and have the spirit of God. It's not so. See? Verse 9, if, there's that word again, we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice it is a cleansing. That's what we need to have our minds and our lives cleaned through the laws and commandments of God, his spirit and his truth and walking in the light. All of it together. That is the whole package of the meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread for the New Testament to put in Christ and to put out sin. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Subjunctive. May not. That tells us that we can sin, but notice. And yet, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. In other words, the relationship that we have with God is this. He calls us, we repent, we are baptized, He's forgiven our sins. He gives us the Holy Spirit. Now then, that is a beginning and that is a start. 
the finished product does not come until the resurrection. And between the start and the finish is the whole life of living by every word of God. As Jesus said, man, that means men and women, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that comes right back to what? Obey my voice. So you see how consistent the Bible is all the way through? So God is there to forgive you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now some sins are very hard to overcome, so you may have to repent of them over and over again for a long time until they are wiped out of your mind because it's not that God doesn't forgive you, it is that you need your mind transformed as we read earlier. By what? The renewing of your mind. And to renew your mind, you need to get rid of the old mind that was in there, which was carnal and hostile and against God. So you see how that works. All right. Now then, Jesus gave a warning to the scribes and Pharisees that we're not just to put on a front. We're not to appear righteous outwardly, but inwardly we're full of greed and lust. Now there are some people who are so good at putting on that they actually live a double life. Sometimes being married, and the husband of the wife does not know that the double life is going on for years and years and years and years. Now that's sad, but that shows you how deceitful the carnal mind is. So let's see what Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees. Let's come to Luke 11. See. Now we're not to be bums and filthy dirty on the outside. That is true. But what good does it do if you're the nicest, most handsome man or the most beautiful woman in the world, finely dressed with the best of everything, and your mind is evil and sinful? Doesn't do you any good. All right? Okay. Now... <clears throat> Let's pick it up right here. Verse 34, Luke 11 and verse 34. Now we talked about the light, okay? Here's what Jesus said. Verse 34, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is without guile, your whole body is light. See, because evil affects your whole body. It affects not only how you think, it affects how your body functions, etc. But when your eye is evil, your whole body is dark, see? When your whole body is light, see? Without guile. But when your eye is evil, your whole body is dark. Therefore, beware that the light that is in you is not darkness. Now then, if your whole body is light, not having any part dark, it shall be full of light as when a lamp shining brightly gives you light. And while he was speaking, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down. Now Jesus committed a great sin when he went in and sat down. Because he didn't wash his hands. <sighs> that was a ghastly sin. But the Pharisee, seeing this, wondered why he had not washed first before dinner. And of course Jesus knew this. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greediness and wickedness. And how much evil is covered 
with a facade of goodness. That's exactly what they were doing. So Jesus wasted no time. Verse 40, he said, fools, did not he who made the outside also make the inside? Rather give alms from the things that are within, and behold, all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay mint of tithes and rue and every herb, but you pass over the judgment and love of God. It is obligatory for you to do these things and not set aside these lesser things. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and salutations in the marketplaces. Oh, yes. Here comes the rabbi. Here comes the priest. Look, it's the pope. <laughs> okay. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are as unseen graves, and men who walk over them do not know it. Now, that's pretty strong. Then one of the doctors said, Teacher, by saying these things, you're insulting us also. So then he went on to say, Woe to you, doctors of the law. You're worse than ever. Because you bind people down with burdens, okay? So you don't cleanse just the outside. You cleanse the inside. Okay? Now, let's see how all of that works. Let's put all of this together here. Okay? Let's come to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the psalm of repentance. And this is so fantastic, and this is so important, because, you see, there can be no forgiveness without repentance, and there can be no change in overcoming unless you are growing in grace and knowledge. And what is going to happen, uh, the longer you are in the church, and the more that you are overcoming and growing, the more that you are going to understand the sin deep within. Now, Psalm 51. Now, this is the repentance of David after his affair with Bathsheba. And you talk about self-deception. You talk about taking advantage of office. You talk about using your authority improperly. Same way with Bathsheba. She knew what she was doing. She consented to it because it takes two to tangle. So when he came to himself and repented, now how long was he converted? Decades. This should have never happened. Now, with us, it needs to be the same way. That's why when we start getting old and gray, We've got to watch and make sure that we don't think that we have it made and we regress back into sin. So here's how he started out. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. First John, the first chapter, the same thing right there. Now notice, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And the sin is lust within. The sin is the evil thoughts. And like we started out right there in Mark the seventh chapter. Okay? Now here's what we need to do. This is what David did. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. When you sin, yes, other people are involved, other people get hurt, but you sin against God. Because God says you shall not, and you do. God says you shall do this, and you don't. See how that works? 
that you may be justified when you speak and be right when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's just another way of talking about the law of sin and death. And that's the thing that we have to fight within. And that's the thing that needs to be cleansed and rooted out and replaced with the word of God, the love of God, the, the scriptures of God. And we need to have it in such a way that as we are led by the spirit of God, we think with the laws and commandments and words and precepts and concepts of God. Not in terms of carnality. Not in terms of the way that the world is, but in the way that God is. Okay? Verse 6, here is the key. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you shall make me to know wisdom. That's something. We must have the wisdom of God through his spirit and through having the truth in our inward parts. That starts with God is true, his love is true, his faith is true, his righteousness is true, his word is true, his commandments are true, his precepts are true, everything concerning God is true, and in him there is no variable or variableness or shadow of turning because his light of righteousness is constant all the time. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That's what Jesus says. This takes, this takes repentance. Let's come back here to to. Isaiah, the first chapter. Now, listen, look at how many things we're covering in the Old Testament, and yet we're preaching what? New Testament doctrine, right? Yes. All right. <clears throat> God says right here to people who, what they need to do if they're living in sin, and this is what the world needs to do. Listen, verse 15. God says to those who are following their own religious experience or another Jesus or a Baal or whatever, he says, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. For your hands are full of blood. There needs to be repentance. That's why. Now what I want you to do, I want you to see how very similar 1 John, the first chapter is, with this section of chapter 1 of Isaiah. And that proves another point, which is this. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right? Verse 16. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. How do you do that? This is not the dirt from working someplace. This is the filth of sin which is within. So how do you wash yourself and make yourself clean? We'll see that here in just a little bit. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes cease to do evil. And evil is transgression of the laws of God. Now, you go back and you read 1 John, the second chapter. Right after it says that he, his sacrifice is for the propitiation of our sins, he says, The one who says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Exactly what we have here. Okay? But if we keep his commandments, we know him and his truth is, is in us and we are obligated to walk like he walked. All right? 
So we have the same thing right here in verse 17 of Isaiah, the first chapter. Learn to do good. That takes time. How do you pray? How do you study? All of that. Learn to do good. How do you overcome temper? How do you overcome evil? How do you overcome lying? How do you overcome jealousy? How do you overcome sexual obsessions? See? Learn to do good. Have your mind cleansed. And we'll see how God does that. Okay? Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek judgment. Reprove the oppressor. Judge the orphan. Plead for the widow. Now notice, God says, you do that, you come to me, and here's what will happen. Verse 18, same thing. Notice how this parallels 1 John, the first chapter. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as wool, white as snow, rather. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If, same thing, if, isn't it interesting? Independent, free, independent, free, moral agency, ifma, if, and it applies to us, okay? If you are willing and obedient, and didn't we read that, that we have to obey Christ? Yes, indeed. You shall eat the good of the land. But if, there it is, the choices. We have to choose. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The word of God never fails. Remember that never fails. Not one word of it. Okay? Now, let's come back here to the, to the New Testament. Let's come, let's come to Romans, the seventh chapter. And let's see what it tells us about human nature and the law of sin and death. And then we will see what we need to do so that we are unleavened from the inside out. Okay. And isn't that true? Leavened bread, you don't put the leaven in it. And it's unleavened from the inside out. When there is leaven in it, it puffs up from the inside out. Isn't that correct? Yes. All right. Now, Romans 7, after showing that we have to keep the commandments of God because they're holy, they're righteous, they're true, okay? Then Paul talks about the working of human nature within him. And even though he's converted, even though he has the Spirit of God, even though he knows what is right, even though he knows what is wrong, human nature is there to pull us down. So Paul explains it, and he says that we are rescued from it through Jesus Christ. Okay? Now then, let's pick it up here in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, having been sold as a slave under sin. Because what I'm working out myself, if I do it myself, and it turns out to be sin, I do not know. What well, made me do it? For what I do not desire to do, this I do. Moreover, what I hate, this is what I do. And we find ourselves in that situation many, many times. That's why there needs to be prayer every day, study every day, repentance every day, and even repentance right in the minute when something happens that isn't right. You can pray in your own mind to God for forgiveness for it, you see, because the way is, of man is not in him to direct his steps. It has to come from the Spirit of God. See? See? 
Verse 16. But if I am doing what I do not desire to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Nothing wrong with the law. It pointed out to you what was wrong. So then I am no longer working it out myself. Rather, it is the sin dwelling within me. Has it yet been all the way removed? Because I fully understand that there is not dwelling within me, that is, within my fleshly being, any good. For the desire to do good is present with, within me, but how to work out that which is good I find not. For the good I desire to do, I'm not doing. The evil that I do not desire to do, this I'm doing. We find ourselves in that, don't we? But it's sin, verse 20, within me that is doing it. Verse 21, here's the key. Consequently, I find this law in my members. That's the law of sin and the law of death. That when I desire to do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law warring within my own members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me in captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of death? And it is through Jesus Christ. Now let's see how that works, okay? Let's see how that works. Let's come to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. And the putting away of the spiritual leaven in our minds is a daily exercise, something we need to do all of the time. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. All right. Now let's pick it up here in verse 3 because this becomes one of the most important sections in the Bible tied together with Romans 7. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not warring according to the flesh. There, there are no possible ways of human endeavor to get rid of sin within. That can only be done by repentance and by God's spirit and by learning to do good, cease from doing evil, have our minds cleansed. Now notice, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the overthrowing of strongholds and the strongholds are what? That law of sin and death. Casting down vain imaginations. How we think. Vain reasonings. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is a description of how we must overcome. Bringing every thought, don't get carried away with carnal wild ideas. Bring every thought into captivity to Christ. Get rid of those things out of your mind, you see. That's getting rid of the leaven. Put out the leaven. That's why Paul said, for Christ has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of spirit and truth. See? That's how we do it right here. Now notice, and having a readiness to avenge all disobedience whenever your obedience has been fulfilled. See? Bring every thought into captivity. All right? Now let's come to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Let's see what we are admonished to do here in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Now there are 
tell you, the book of Ephesians is a wonderful, tremendous book, and to help you grow and change and overcome, see? Now let's pick it up here in verse 26. Here's what Christ is doing. Rely on Christ to change and grow and overcome with the Spirit of God so that he might sanctify it, that is the church, each and every Christian, having cleansed it, he's cleaning us, forgiving us, purging, we have our part, we need to cease to do evil, learn to do well, with the washing of the water by the word. Now what is that? The water is the spirit of God. The word is is the Word of God. So we use the Spirit of God to train our mind, to renew our mind, to let it be converted. We grow and overcome. That's how we become unleavened, you see. Unleavened from the sin within and only through the sacrifice of Christ and only through his being our Passover and the forgiveness of sin is this possible with the Holy Spirit of God through the washing of the water of the word. That's how we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. See, there it is right there. All right, now we have our part. Come over here to chapter 4. Okay? Chapter 4. Now this tells us what we need to do. It is put out the leaven, put out the sin, put in the righteousness. Have your mind cleansed and scrubbed with the washing of the water by the word. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay, let's pick it up here in verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him according to the truth in Jesus, that concerning our former conduct you put off the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind by the spirit of God, by the washing of the word of God, by bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and that you put on the new man, converted, which according to God is created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Then it shows Put away the things of lying. Put away the things of anger. Put away those things that cause you to sin. This is why there is repentance every day and growing and overcoming every day. And I'll tell you one thing. After all the years that I've been in a ministry, I'll tell you one thing. That the more that you do this, the more that you will understand how evil and rotten and wretched that human nature is and why we need the mind of Christ and the spirit of Christ and why it is so important for us to grow in grace and knowledge this way. So Paul says right here, and we'll finish this message with this verse, chapter 5 and verse 1, Ephesians 5 and verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, even as Christ also loved us, and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor, and then he finishes the rest of the chapter there by saying, put away sin. That is in summary. Okay. So this is how we are unleavened in Christ. This is why Christ died for us. This is why he gives us the Holy Spirit. And so be renewed in your mind. Bring every thought into captivity, into the obedience of Christ and the love of God. Have a good feast of unleavened bread.